This is the story of an extraordinary hour in the life of one of North America's major cities. On August 25th, 2004, a hostage crisis played out in front of thousands of commuters and millions of TV viewers. At 8 o'clock that morning, two strangers started their day. They would never meet, but within 60 minutes, one would have taken the other's life. Can you really, really make this shot? And again, don't miss. Toronto, Canada, 8 a.m. Like any other weekday morning, the streets are filled with commuters. Downtown in the city, it is business as usual. 19 degrees, temperature right now, 40% chance of showers this afternoon. One person on his way to work is Gordon Lusby. He's 39 years old, has a wife, and lives in the suburbs. His neighbors like him. He is also one of Toronto's deadliest men. Gordon is a member of the Emergency Task Force, Toronto's SWAT team. Every day he practices for over three hours to perfect a skill he hopes he'll never have to use. Gordon is a sniper, and he's trained to kill. You obviously have that in the back of the mind, that one day you might have to take someone's life. No one wants to. Um, I didn't come to the ETF to become a SWAT team member to take a life, but you might have to do that. Across the city, another man is starting a very different day. Out-of-work chef Anthony Brooks has a score to settle. He already has a long history of domestic violence and abuse. Threats to throw his wife down the stairs, I believe, holding a knife to her throat. And um, uh, almost most bizarre was um, driving around his neighborhood with a fireplace iron poker looking for a 16-year-old son. In March 2004, Brooks put a knife to his wife's throat and told her he was going to kill her. After 18 years of abuse, Marlene Brooks finally reported her violent husband to the police. Brooks was taken to court and charged with domestic assault. The fact that eventually the wife testified against Anthony uh, means that this person uh, was shamed in front of his family, uh, colleagues, uh, friends, um, and this is stressful. This is difficult to deal with. And again, this is another thing that can lead to a loss of self-control. Brooks was sentenced to 30 days in prison and forbidden from contacting his family. While incarcerated, it's believed that Brooks has uh, developed a friendship or relationship with other inmates. And in doing so, he's, he's found out where he can get a gun. Driven by anger at his estranged wife's testimony against him, he was determined to take revenge. On the morning of August 25th, Brooks was due to attend anger management training. Instead, he takes the gun and walks out of his door. He uh, travels to the Royal Bank Tower, and it's clear from videotapes that we've seized that he's laying in wait, waiting for Marlene Brooks to attend to her place of business. And the firearm appears to be concealed down the front of his pants. He uh, ultimately, at about uh, 8.01 a.m. thereabouts, he spots Marlene Brooks and the chase is on. Mr. Brooks gives chase and he runs towards a restaurant known as Mr. Greek. And that's where the first shot is fired. And that's when she begins to run, and he fires two rounds from a sawed-off 22 caliber rifle. I saw him, was, he was carrying a gun. They were coming from that way all the way this, right here. They were already here. And I was calling to the cops, right? And they, both of them, they started running, and they went all the way down there. And then she fell down. And then he started hitting from the gun to the lady on, on her head. With eyewitnesses dialing 911, 
Brooks needs a way out. With no clear sense of what to do next, he runs from the shopping mall. A gunman is now loose on the streets of Toronto in the middle of rush hour. Police emergency control instantly broadcasts details of the shooting and the suspect. And for getting information now that it's a female that's been shot, suspect was last seen towards the elevator in the food court. What time is that, Richard? Ten miles away, at the emergency task force's base, Gordon Lusby hears the call come in. One of us has to fill in work the station operator. Um, so this morning, of course, it's my, my number was up to work the desk. Eric, where's the show going on today? Eric was here. The radio dispatcher will contact you personally. Uh, then you're, you give the information to the team. Um, so if any serious calls come over that you monitor throughout the city, which is quite a few, uh, we can have, you know, over 100 calls a day. So just sitting at the desk, listening to everything unfold. As he listens in from the desk, Gordon Lusby doesn't yet know if the emergency task force will be needed. Downtown in the city, a gunman is at large on the streets. Now saying there was three shots fired, someone yelling, someone's been shot. 803. Toronto police officer Jeffrey McDuff is on routine duty outside the shopping mall. He is coming to the end of his shift when he hears the police dispatcher's broadcast. The only description so far is a male black, 30 to 40 years, heavy build, wearing a green and beige shirt, black pants. For some reason, I just happened to look across the street. I just picked out a male who matched the description. 882 Charlie, I'm, I'm right there, dispatch uh, above it at Bay and Wellington. I didn't catch up to him until we were near the uh, Royal York Hotel. This area was incredibly busy at the time. I guess a train had just let out commuters that were heading to work, so there was a lot of people. I got to within about five to six feet of them, and, and as I was moving to my right, my uh, portable radio went off up here, and uh, he heard it. He immediately spun around without hesitation and drew a sawed-off 22 caliber rifle and uh, pointed it directly at me. Toronto, 8.05 a.m., rush hour. Anthony Brooks has just shot at his wife. Now he is locked in a standoff with a lone police officer and is staring at him down the barrel of a sawed-off rifle. I immediately uh, yelled, gun. I stepped to my right. I drew my service weapon. I issued the police challenge, uh, police don't move. I ordered him to drop the gun. And just as uh, I'm about to get closer to him, two ladies walk directly between us. The whole time, he's just staring at me, got the gun pointed at me, and he's not saying a word. And again, I ordered him to drop the gun, and, and it was at this time that he turned and started to run south uh, towards Front Street. There are three million people in Toronto. There are countless television sets and a multitude of channels on air, day and night. So he'd be there by three, he could shoot for half an hour. Vigilant news teams keep a constant watch over city life. We have seven or eight or nine, maybe ten television stations, a whole host of radio stations. It's uh, very competitive. Three all news stations that are going 24 hours a day. We have one, CBC has one, and City TV has one, and, and we go live to a lot of events. We have uh, what are called the Eyes of Toronto, which are uh, cameras uh, strategically placed around the city. One of those cameras is on top of the CN Tower that looks eastward down into the downtown core. The Eyes of Toronto give local station City TV a panoramic view of the city and their live morning show keeps their audience in the picture. But that morning, the regular TV schedules are dramatically interrupted. Right 8.06 a.m. Officer McDuff is chasing an armed gunman. They are heading for Union, the busiest station in Toronto. 
As he's running away from me, I'm running, I have my gun in my right hand, I've got my left hand on my radio, and I'm broadcasting that I'm in a foot pursuit of a male with a gun. Michelle, you're 42? Yep. The situation escalates with every second. The police dispatcher scrambles Toronto SWAT team, the emergency task force. Team one, suit up. Team one, suit up. When you hear a call like that, it's getting pretty serious. And then add on to the stress that I'm sitting at the front desk watching my teammates go down to it. And it's uh, pretty tough to swallow. I was driving that day. And once we got into the vehicle, I made sure that uh, Chris put his seatbelt on and I put mine on. We were driving onto the shoulder, squeezing past cars within inches with the sirens and everything blaring. Because he is manning the desk, sniper Gordon Lusby is left behind. He has no idea of the role he is soon to play in the developing drama. 10-4, ETF base on the way. The ETF base is 10 miles away from Union Station. It would take them 20 minutes to get to where Officer McDuff was single-handedly dealing with a gunman. Much closer are Toronto's TV stations, just a couple of blocks away, and news is traveling fast. They are listening into police transmissions and are soon scrambling their camera crews to the scene. I heard the call on one of our police scanners. Now, he had already been, you know, afterwards you find out that he had already fired shots in the underground, but the first call I heard was for a man running down the street armed with a gun. Officer McDuff is chasing Anthony Brooks towards Union Station. The gunman doesn't know where to turn. This may be a tipping point right here where he just no longer feels that he can, he has control over his life at this point. He's got, you know, the, 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 the stress is overwhelming and he, maybe it's boiled over and now he's just, he's a desperate man. Among the thousands of commuters making their journey to work that morning is 20-year-old Nicole Regis. She is on a summer job, and today is her last day working at the Royal Bank of Canada. It was a route that she took every day. She'd get off the train, and she'd cross the busy streets in downtown Toronto, and she'd head over to the plaza. It was a short distance, surrounded by people, all busily hurrying to their office towers. She was on her way to work, and it should have been a beautiful summer day. Nicole Regis is oblivious to the drama she is about to walk into. 8.11 a.m., thousands of people are on their way to work. Officer McDuff has pursued Brooks as far as Union Station. I'm telling him not to move, and, and I'm yelling at people to get away, get into cover. Uh, this male's armed. And just out of the corner of my eye, I see this, this young woman walking, and he looked at her, and I looked at her, and he just reached out and grabbed her. Suddenly, she felt someone touch her on the shoulder. Put his, his left arm around her. Grab her around the neck. She thought it was a friend, the kind of things friends jokingly do. Uh, he put the gun to her head and um, hid behind her. Like a nightmare, she realized this was no one she knew. He whispered in her ear. She can remember that whisper. He told her he wouldn't hurt her. Suspect has a female hostage and southbound front towards Union Station. I started to talk to him. I asked him to let her go. I told him, you know, just put your gun down. We can deal with this. He wasn't talking to me at all. He was very upset. He uh, he was whispering constantly to the to the young lady. I don't. I, and again, I knew this man was uh, was on a mission, and he had a purpose or a function that day. Eight twelve a.m. Officer McDuff finds himself dealing with a hostage crisis, which he isn't trained to handle. 
What he needs is a negotiator. Vietnam veteran Sergeant Tom Sharkey is the emergency task force's chief hostage negotiator. We do hundreds and hundreds of calls, and that usually goes very smooth. And I've done, I guess I've done close to a thousand calls. Everything from uh, talking people off bridges to people holding knives to people's throats, uh, people holding guns, and 99% I can resolve them by talking the person down. But this situation is going to test even his powers of persuasion. 8.13 a.m. Officer McDuff is left trying to talk Brooks back from the brink. Sergeant Sharkey and the ETF are battling through traffic. But the news cameras are already at the scene, and they are rolling. There just happened to be two camera crews downtown in the area where the hostage taking went on. They were on the scene almost immediately. They were within a few feet of this man with his gun and his hostage uh, and, and police officers. Toronto's hostage crisis was becoming critical. Police officers struggled to contain the gathering crowds. There was plainclothes police officers, um, uniformed police officers, and the, the city police that are on their on their bicycles in the lycra getups. Um, it was just sort of surreal, you know, uh, plainclothes men. Guns pulled on the corner, more out of a Hollywood movie than it was in downtown Toronto. I couldn't get any information from any of the police that were there. And of course, the ones with their guns pulled, it's not like I was really tapping them on their shoulder. The media wants the best view of the developing crisis. News producer Angela Noss finds it in the hotel across the street. So I came in and I went to the window, looked down and could not believe my eyes. I had the clearest view of sort of what was unfolding in front of me. Angela is perfectly positioned to report on what was going on. I'd never reported before, so for me it was um, a shock and uh, took a big deep breath and uh, the next thing I heard was Harry Forstall, the anchor, saying, joining us now from Union Station, CBC News producer Angela Nods. Angela, bring us up to date if you can. What is happening there? Hi, Harry. What I can tell you is I'm on the second floor of the Royal York where we have quite a clean sight of uh, a man who has a woman, we're assuming, as a hostage. Um, he's bearing a gun in his right hand and has his arm around her neck. The 10-man ETF team arrives at the scene. Uh, all hands on deck, if you will, when it comes to Toronto Police, ETF, Tactical Squad, you name it. Everyone is out there trying to handle this situation. We're going to try to confirm exactly what's going on, but we are hearing... That Negotiator Sergeant Sharkey and the ETF instantly take up tactical positions. With the gunman at large in an open street, their first priority is to contain the situation. My job basically is just to fill in the holes uh, as a team leader. I just took, basically took a look around, saw what, what avenues or what things needed to be done, and I directed a few people. Like, we needed uh, somebody on the opposing side of the street, and we tried to set up, like, an L-shaped configuration so we don't avoid shooting each other. <laughs> it's like we don't put ourselves in a crossfire situation. With his team in place, Sergeant Sharkey prepares to start negotiating. His role? To persuade the armed hostage taker to surrender. Get some of these divisionals cleared out. Negotiation is something we take very, very seriously here. The primary thing for us is to establish a rapport, uh, get a speaking relationship with the individual, try to bring the individual down, and try to get a resolution that we can resolve the scene peacefully. 40 feet away, Sergeant Sharkey is positioned so that he could speak to Brooks, look him in the eye, but also take cover if necessary. I just explained to him I was. I wanted to talk to him. I didn't want to hurt him. Showed him I had a radio in my hand. Showed the other hand was empty, and I left my soft cap on. In other words, just trying to get him to look on me a little bit different than the guys around him with the helmets and the guns. 
I've done hundreds and hundreds of speaking to people in just about every situation you can imagine, and I've always been able to get at least an initial conversation going. Uh, this was different. There was no conversation with this guy. Male's now moving with the female, still in front of the uh, real patient. He's getting really jittery. Steve, watch out, he's going your way. Watch out. With the life of Nicole Regis hanging in the balance and a gunman who won't talk, Sergeant Sharkey knows the time for negotiation is running out fast. Take you live back to Front Street, where we are understanding that Toronto police are engaged in an apparent hostage situation, and there we have members of the ETF. Wednesday, August 25th, 2004. An isolated shooting incident had become a full-scale hostage crisis, right in the middle of Toronto's rush hour. And it was all unfolding under the gaze of the city's cameras. Gunman Anthony Brooks' attempt to murder his wife had failed. Then he snatched a stranger from the street and put a gun to her head. I began speaking to him, telling him uh, we wanted to resolve the scene peacefully. We didn't want to hurt him. We wanted to make sure the young lady wasn't hurt. And uh, basically on that theme, I kept asking him, could he please drop the gun? Would he please speak to me? We see negotiators. Um... Not that far from him, maybe 30 feet from him, that have been talking to him, telling him to put down the gun. Uh, there's no talking going on right now. This gentleman here just ignored me totally. Uh, after maybe five, six minutes of uh, constantly pleading with him to speak to me, to try and uh, resolve this peacefully, he uh, basically only said a couple of lines. And all he said to me during the whole thing was, if you want to talk to me, come here. And that basically was all he said to me. The one person who Brooks will talk to is his hostage, Nicole Regis. She is a shoulder to cry on, albeit at gunpoint. Mr. Brooks indicates to her that uh, he's not going to hurt her, that uh, the police are here, and uh, he is talking to Miss Regis about um, the relationship, the very poor relationship he has with his family, and that basically his family have uh, betrayed him and have brought him to do what he's doing today. He's looking around. He still has the uh, gun that's now on his shoulder. He was irate. He was a, a very dangerous individual, um, very agitated, um, non-responsive. He was not open to any form of negotiation. He was just basically shielding himself with a hostage, pointing the gun to her repeatedly. Um, just a nasty situation altogether. Sergeant Sharkey's negotiations are going nowhere. There is one way to be certain of resolving the standoff. We have to always think the worst is going to transpire. And so when we get on scene, we, we hope and try for negotiations. We try to contain somebody, prevent them from moving around. But we always have to think the worst can possibly happen, and we have to have sort of the, uh, the antidote in place for that. And, and really, and if, if things were going to go bad, the best person to have in that position was a, was a sniper, and Gord Lesby specifically. Uh, on our team, um, um, my designation would be Sierra One. I'm our number one sniper, and I probably shoot that rifle every day. It's just something you do every scenario when you get set up as a sniper. It's just an ongoing thing so to prepare for that time. For Gordon, that time has come. He's not talking, he's waving the gun around, so uh, we need a Sierra unit on scene. Gordon had been deployed to hostage takings many times before, but this time was going to be different. I get the call to suit up, run downstairs, grab my rifle, set up the car, run upstairs, get changed as quickly as I can. The adrenaline's always pumping, always. But uh, your training and your techniques that you usually do come forward and they'll take over the situation. Yeah, this is Sierra One. I'm on uh, route. Uh, be heading down to the DVP in a moment. This is obviously a live shot as we're searching uh, for whatever we can see in the tactical squad. Uh, ETF from Toronto police are in various positions trying to deal with the situation. We do not know what has triggered any of this. At 8.42, sniper Gordon Lusby arrives at the scene. I actually saw a regular police officer standing not too far away, so I asked him to come over just to watch my back while I was getting ready. I got kitted up, um, put the balaclava helmet, my uh, low bearing vest on. I uh, got my rifle ready. 
and was at the time still also listening to my radio, trying to decipher where exactly they wanted me to go. Forty, are you on the air? Forty. Hey, this is Mountain Car coming up right now. Gordon needs a location which will give him what police call the 100% solution. A clear line of fire with no room for error. His teammates have found him a sniper position hidden behind the pillars of Union Station. Gordo, if you take the south side and stick right up against the station and drop down to the uh, uh, lower entrance, the loading ramp here, you have the solution. With his rifle readied and over his shoulder, Gordon goes to the spot. Unnoticed by Brooks, he takes aim. Where I set up, he had his hand draped over her shoulder. The gun was pointing right at me. He didn't realize that. But uh, when I got up through my scope, when I first got into position and looked up at him, uh, his barrel of his gun was pointing directly at me. Let's go back to what's really happening here. This is uh, breaking news here on Breakfast Television. This is what we understand. Toronto police are engaged in a hostage situation. We are hearing that a man armed with a gun is holding a woman hostage. The police communication center is coordinating radio traffic and monitoring the media. The emergency task force is informed that their every move is being shown to TV audiences. Information from 31, just advising City Pulse is broadcasting this live. Just wanted officers to be aware of this. Typically when we respond to a call, there's a lot of eyes on us, whether it be other policemen or specifically the media as well too. We're kind of used to having their eyes on us. Our team is uh, extremely professional in that manner, contrary to a lot of uh, portrayals by Hollywood and things like that. Watch for developments as they uh, continue here on Breakfast Television and we'll be taking you through. City News, Jamie speaking. By covering the story live, local station City TV is running a risk of broadcasting a potentially violent ending to the crisis on morning television. It is a risk they are prepared to take. That's the nature of live news gathering. We, our job is to show the public as true a representation as we can of what's going on in the city. Um, but if it happened live, then it happens live. We're giving you as many live looks as possible so that you can understand the complexity of this situation. Hey, get back there. Down on the street, onlookers are trying to make sense of what they can see. Police officers were trying to push us back. We didn't go back. Uh, there were 30 people standing behind us, looking, shaking their heads, couldn't believe that this was uh, going on. Hi, I'm Peter Murphy with CTV. How are you doing? Peter is gathering material for bulletins later in the day. Angela Noss is struggling to find enough information to feed back to the live studio. How much chaos has this created uh, in the street out in front of Union Station? Because it is a busy street, and uh, is it filled with police vehicles? Uh, the, no, the, the street has been taped off. The police vehicles aren't technically right in front of Union Station. They're at either end of the block, which you know is Bay on one and York on the other. The facts were really loosey-goosey. The police really weren't talking. Um, so what I started to do was, you know, you get to a point where once you've reported what you see in front of you and there's no movement, um, you have to start thinking, be more creative and start thinking about other things that you could sort of speak to. Have you... I heard, I heard a few people coming out of Union Station saying, the police told me to get out, the police told me to get out, and that's about it. The situation is at a standstill. Sergeant Sharkey's negotiations have failed. Apart from one shouted sentence, Brooks has remained silent. Even the media has run out of things to say. We'll be right back. Stay with us. All of Toronto is holding its breath. As a hostage crisis plays out in Toronto, tension in the air is palpable. You could see people starting to gather. You could see the silent sort of whirring of the police sirens. I noticed the, the pigeons on top of the station almost seemed to be watching too. They were totally motionless. So, so everything just seemed to be totally focused. All the energy of the, of the moment was totally focused in on what was happening in front of the, uh, the hot dog stand in front of the train station. You could hear a pin drop out there as a police uh, make their... I remember being behind the pillar, and I was amazed that 
we're in a city of roughly three million people. All those eyes are on us right now. And I could hear birds flapping. I could hear Tom, Sergeant Sharkey, speaking to the suspect. And it was like everything just stopped. I just got the sense that the situation was very menacing. It was just this pregnant sense of, of doom for somebody. And, um, and it was just, you know, 40 minutes, if I recall, of, of them trying to negotiate. And, and uh, from my vantage point, uh, Brooks did not seem to be seriously mulling um, the alternatives or, or did it look like he was going anywhere. Nicole Regis has been held captive for 35 minutes by an increasingly agitated gunman. She just froze and stayed very calm, very calm. I think it was probably the best thing she could ever have done. She didn't panic, she stayed calm, and the calmer she stayed, the calmer he would probably be. What she did was very brave and very, very clever. The situation is critical. All she can do is wait. I wasn't sure what at the time, but you know, something in the back of your head is just saying, oh, something's not right, something's, something's different this time, and uh, you know, something bad is gonna happen. He seemed to get more erratic. You'll see him uh, maneuvering the young lady around and pointing the gun around. Uh, he also began to start pointing the gun at us. He actually began to look down the barrel as he was aiming it at me, like he was actually trying to take an aim uh, a shot. The hair is all standing up in the back of my neck. I'm getting that feeling that, oh, you know, I'm going to have to do something here. I'm going to have to take that shot. Have you got a solution right now? From time to time, I get about half a head. Gordon's position gives him a clear right. view of his intended target, Anthony Brooks. But simply seeing him is not enough. I would have been very reluctant to take a shot from there. It's one thing to take the shots at the range. Do it in your sleep. It's another thing when you see another human being holding another human being's life in their hands in front of you, saying, can you really, really make this shot? And again, don't miss. Gordon has to pinpoint the perfect shot, the instantaneous kill, the 100% solution. Most snipers in the world will train in shooting into what we call a cranial vault, basically a band, uh, almost like a ski mask area around uh, uh, your head, which uh, gives you the greatest chance of incapacitation if a bullet goes into that location. Uh, in other words, it's a less likely for a reflex action, someone squeezing the trigger. It's like turning a light switch off. Your muscular system will just shut down, your nervous system will just shut down. It's a 100% it's guarantee that when you hit that shot, um, that he's just going to drop like he's been turned off. One, two, two, Lusby, go on to Alpha One. Only Gordy, repeat, go on to Alpha One. I got word over my headset to switch over to a secure channel that we use just for the sniper. I get over the air and I tell my, my team and my supervisor that I have a 100% solution on the subject, which means basically that at any given second, that I am prepared to take that shot, and I'm ready to go. Good boy, Chris and I are on your 7 o'clock. 100% solution at this point. Angela, have you heard any shots fired? There were reports earlier that uh, someone had heard a shot fired. Any indication that that's been the case? No, no, Harry, I have not heard any shots fired. The police and the gunman have reached stalemate. Brooks will neither negotiate nor surrender. Sergeant Sharkey has run out of time. Again, I'm trying to speak to him. He aims down the barrel. Uh, at that time, I gave the order to have the, the sniper fire. I got the word to take the shot. So it was, uh, I don't know how to word that, but it, it was a, an overwhelming feeling of me relaxing, because now the decision wasn't mine to make. And it made it so much easier for me to take that shot now because I'm being told to take the shot. I knew when the order was given, I knew who it was coming from. 
Um, so it was just a, a very quick and clear, loud, take the shot, take the shot, take the shot. Welcome back to Breakfast Television. Astonishing news, uh, breaking news from our streets right now. We're giving you a live look at Front Street where we're hearing that a man armed with a gun is holding a woman hostage. Hostage Nicole Regis's fate is out of her hands, poised between a gunman and a police sniper. Chief Negotiator Sergeant Sharkey has to make a choice. The officer uh, is pointing the gun and waving around at the officers at this point. That's why I like waving the gun around at the officers. When someone points a gun at you, okay, who, especially in a situation where you know it's a real gun and they've previously fired that gun, you certainly make the assumption they're going to try and kill you. And uh, at that time, I gave the order to have the, the sniper fire. Melody's found with IM2. Okay. Although I told another individual from the CBC. Suspect is down. Suspect is down. Get an ambulance immediately. 10-4, suspect down. The victim is safe. 10-4, victim safe. Harry, are you still there? Yes, I am. Um, they have taken him down. He's been shot in the head. The hostage is away from him. He's been shot. He's been shot. Ambulance! When the shots rang out, uh, uh, my immediate reaction was, uh, uh, you know, I yelled out, he shot, he shot. And of course, you know, you, as, as a reporter, you're not supposed to do that kind of thing. You're, you're supposed to stay detached, uh, but I, I, I was just so shocked. Shots were fired. We've just heard that shots have been fired. This is in the second situation. By being on the wrong live camera at the wrong time, City TV spares Toronto's morning show viewers the spectacle of a man being shot dead on live TV. But eyewitnesses at the scene struggle with seeing the final moments of the crisis for real. It was almost like the ultimate theater. There were none of the sort of stock things that you see when a, a hostage situation in a movie is building to a boiling point. There was no soundtrack. It was just quiet, and there was a shot, and then a body crumpled in a very unnatural way. Hey, get back there. Get back there. For reporter Peter Murphy, the reality of the shot doesn't hit home until he sees it on the screen. It wasn't until I got into the edit suite that we took a look at the, the two camera positions that we had, and we had to go back and forth over the moment of when this man gets his head blown off, uh, and you look at it in slow motion, and we were deciding, well, we can't show the actual event happening, so we have to freeze frame it. That, you know, really upset me. Uh, and and I, I, you know, I've been in, in a lot of ugly situations in my 40 years in journalism. It's ridiculous. One of those things you never think you'd see. Like you see in a movie, and you're like, "Yo, all cool." It's not cool, man. It's not cool at all. Now we're looking at what looks like uh, could be the, the female hostage. Uh, she's being patted on the back. Very quickly, officers uh, sort of swooped in and uh, gently walked her uh, right toward me. She was within 10 feet of me, and it was just a bizarre look on her face. It was almost a smile, but you, you have to think that it was more just a nervous smile, and her mouth was agape, and uh, uh, just I, I won't forget that look on her face. For the hostage, the onlookers, and the media, the drama is finally over. But for the emergency task force, another chapter is just beginning. They are now the subject of a criminal inquiry conducted by the Special Investigations Unit. This may be standard practice when the authorities kill a civilian, but the SIU still has to determine whether the police had acted appropriately. And the man who took the shot, Gordon Lusby, finds himself at the heart of the inquiry. You are locked into a room, they come and, you know, you got to leave your gun belt and your clothes behind, and it's, it's kind of humiliating. You know, you train, you do what you're supposed to do, you do what you're told to do, but then there's that whole gray area of, oh, am I going to get in trouble for this? I couldn't sleep a wink for four nights, um, wide awake, and that actually bothered me quite a bit. 
because I was 100% okay with what happened. Um, after the four nights of sleepless nights, uh, my wife told me that I was actually sleeping, but I was having horrible nightmares and you no know, waking up in the middle of the night and in a cold sweat. The investigation uncovers two crucial details, vital facts which are only revealed when the police watch CCTV footage of the day's events. Brooks was going to take his ex-wife's life that day of August 25th and then take his own life. The video captures Brooks placing the firearm underneath his chin as well and pulling the trigger. We found later on when it's examined that the gun had jammed. There were still uh, five live rounds in the magazine of the gun, but apparently when he was shooting at his wife, the thing had jammed on him. Well, we didn't know that, obviously, at the time. It is a tragic irony. Brooks was not the threat that police thought him to be. But though the jammed gun saved the life of his wife, it set off the day's violent chain of events. Deadly end to a downtown hostage taking. The media proves an unlikely ally for the emergency task force and Gordon Lusby. The constantly rolling news cameras left no room for speculation when it came to the threat Brooks seemed intent on posing. Ultimately, the investigation concluded that Gordon had no alternative but to shoot. It unfolded for the whole world to see. In fact, letters came in to the chief of police at that time saying, I can't believe the restraint your police officers used. So the public were behind us, and, uh, and I like to think the media were as well. Abused wife Marlene Brooks survived her battering and resumed her old job in the shopping mall. Hostage Nicole Regis returned to college. But Gordon Lusby is left wondering. His actions may have been publicly justified, but it was the first time in Canadian history that a sniper had ever had to take a man's life, and Gordon pulled the trigger. It's not something I would have wanted to do. It's not something I'm proud of. I don't want to say it bothers me, but, I mean, you can't help think about it. There's probably not a day that goes by that I don't think about it, but um, all the people that were supposed to go home that day went home and unharmed. So keep telling yourself that and, uh, and you go on and, and, and everything's good.